One time when I was pastoring in a, another city, uh, I received uh, some information that a family in our church had had a death, and so um, I was preparing to go and minister to them, but I did not know them. I'd been the pastor of this church for several years and had never met this family. So I went to one of our deacons who actually grew up in this city, kind of knew everybody, and I asked him if he knew the family, and he said, oh yeah, I know them. And so I just said, well, can you, what can you tell me? And he said, well, they've really kind of struggled. They've had lots of issues and challenges through the years, um, told me about some of those. And then in the midst of the conversation, I asked him, our deacon, I said, are they believers? And he paused and kind of got quiet and thought for a moment. And he said, well, yes. And then he kept thinking and then he said, and no. I said, well, please explain. And he said, well, yes, they're believers and that they've heard the gospel. Yes, they're believers and they have at some point, I think, made some kind of choice about Jesus to believe in Jesus. Yes, they apparently joined the church at some point. Yes, they were probably baptized. But no, in the sense that they've never really committed their lives to this decision. As far as I know, they've never been real active in church. They've never really pursued studying the Bible. And if you look at their lifestyles, I have a whole lot of concerns about whether they really know Jesus or not. So his answer was interestingly yes and no. So my question today, is it possible to sort of believe in Jesus, but not fully believe in Jesus? Is it possible to believe in Jesus for what he can do for us and then completely miss out on the relationship that he wants to have with us? Is it possible to have a superficial faith that is not a real faith, that's not an authentic faith? Well, interestingly, as we look at the scriptures that we're going to be studying today and a connected verse that comes right before them, and I'll talk about the connection in just a moment, it seems that this is not a new thing. Right after we read the story in John chapter 2 of Jesus cleansing the temple, we have a summary statement. It says, Now while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs. Those are the miracles. They saw the signs that Jesus was performing and believed in his name. And then the next sentence says this, But Jesus would not entrust himself to them for, they, for he knew all people. And what I believe this is telling us is that these people had believed in the miracles and believed in Jesus in some sense because of the miracles, but Jesus would not entrust himself to them because he knew everyone's heart and he had some concerns. Something wasn't quite right with their belief. And so I think that's something I want us to consider today as we examine our text and really this question of what is real belief, authentic belief. And really the sermon title is this, do you really believe in the real Jesus? That's a very important question that we need to understand and answer for ourselves. Do you really believe in the real Jesus? Let's turn in our Bibles to John chapter 4, and we're going to look at the very last story in John chapter 4, beginning in verse 43. It says, after the two days he left for Galilee, the two days that we're talking about is the two days he spent in Samaria with the Samaritans. And you might remember, and we talked about this last week, 
Jesus had a two-day revival in a very unexpected place. He ministered to a Samaritan woman, offered her living water, this Samaritan woman at the well, and then eventually revealed his true identity to her, that he was the long-awaited Messiah. She excitedly runs back to her village and begins to testify that she's met this man that's told her everything about her life. Could he be the Messiah? The village ends up all coming down to the well, meeting Jesus, and then they have a two-day event. And it turns into a spiritual revival, and they tell the woman at the end, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. And then we read this, after the two days, he left for Galilee. So he's leaving Samaritan soil, and he's going back to Jewish soil, his hometown area, we're going to find out. And he's back among his Jews. And verse 44, though, gives kind of a a sad commentary about his hometown and his home soil and the Jewish people that live there. It says, Now Jesus himself had pointed out that a prophet has no honor in his own country. And so we're seeing a little bit of a contrast here. He's been in Samaria, which was really, as we know the story, a rival people group, a people group that had a lot of antagonism against the Jews and vice versa, and they had a revival. Authentic believers came from Samaria in this village. But then Jesus says he's back in his own country, and a prophet in his own country does not have honor. And then it says, strangely, verse 45, it says, when he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. But then it clarifies that. It says, they had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, for they had also been there. They're talking about the miracles, which John calls signs. And so they welcomed this miracle man, Jesus, back to the hometown, probably in hopes that he would do some more miracles among them. And then we read this in verse 46, once more he visited Cana in Galilee where he had turned the water into wine. You might remember Cana is um, a little village that was very close to Nazareth, probably within four miles of Nazareth, where Jesus actually grew up. This is his home territory in Galilee. And it was also the place, we're told here, reminded that just a few chapters earlier, John chapter 2, Jesus had performed his first miracle at the wedding. When his mother told him about the problem that the, the family, the bride and the groom's family had run out of wine. And it was a, a real, uh, could have been a very embarrassing thing for this family, a social faux pas. And so he then turned the water into wine and um, saved the day for the family and the wedding ceremony. Then it says, and there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick in Capernaum. Now, Capernaum is about 14 miles from Cana, and it's on the Sea of Galilee. Later, Jesus ends up making Capernaum his kind of ministry headquarters. And so this royal official probably worked for Herod Antipas. He was uh, one of the rulers of that time. He was the son of King Herod the Great. And uh, was a guy that uh, Jesus did not have fond feelings for and vice versa. Herod Antipas was the guy who ends up killing John the Baptist. Herod Antipas was the guy that eventually tries to track down Jesus and have him killed. Herod Antipas is the guy that Jesus ends up being sent to at his trial. You remember Pontius Pilate eventually tries to send Jesus away to another official to make a decision about him. He sends him to Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas wants him to perform a miracle. And Jesus refuses to even talk to him. And eventually he's mocked and abused by Herod Antipas' servants and his soldiers, and he's sent back to Pilate. There is not much love lost between these two. But this guy works apparently for Herod Antipas. And he shows up, and it says he showed up because he had heard Jesus 
had arrived back in Galilee. This is verse 47. And he come from Judea. And so he went to him and he begged him to come and heal his son who was close to death. And Jesus responds in verse 48, Unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. Sounds like a pretty harsh statement. A rebuffing statement to a desperate father who wants Jesus to come and heal his son who is about to die. And Jesus is really speaking to him, but I think to everyone about their infatuation and their desperate, dire need for all of these signs and these miracles. Seems a little harsh, but what we see next is an act of great compassion. Verse 49, the royal official said, Sir, come down before my child dies. Again, he's undeterred. He's persistent. Please. He's begging him. Lord Jesus, please come and heal my child. No doubt he has heard about Jesus being this miracle-working man. Miracle man from Galilee. He came from Capernaum. We know that at some point, Jesus performed three powerful miracles in Capernaum. He healed a centurion's servant, and the centurion was stationed in Capernaum. He actually raised Jairus' daughter from the dead in Capernaum. And then we have that famous story you might remember where uh, Jesus was preaching in a home. We think it was Peter's house. And uh, suddenly some, some guys climb up on the roof and they dig a, a hole in the roof and they lowered their paralyzed friend down on a mat in front of Jesus because it was too crowded to get to him otherwise. You remember that story? That happened in Capernaum. And so no doubt it might have been one of those stories or others that people had told this royal official about and said, this Jesus is somebody you need to go see if you want your son to be healed. And so he went for the reason of this miracle man from Galilee. That's all he knew about Jesus at this point. And he goes and desperately asks him to come and heal his child. Verse 50, Jesus says, go, your son will live. Now this is a little unusual for a healing miracle. We have all kinds of healing miracles in the Bible. In fact, you can track down 18 different healing miracles that Jesus performed. This is one of them. And in most of them, almost all of them, it involved his physical presence to be there. And that was really the custom even in the Old Testament prophets. God did allow some of the prophets and even the apostle Paul and others to have the ability to provide healing on different occasions, but almost always their physical presence was required, but not here. This was different. And Jesus just told the man, go, go back home and your son will live. And really as an act of faith, the man leaves. It says next, at the end of the next sentence, it says, the man took Jesus at his word and departed meaning he was going to be heading back home. Now, probably what had happened is he had gotten up early in the morning. We get a little bit of a time frame here in just a moment of when the miracle took place. He got up early in the morning, and he uh, hurried. He walked and, uh, and, and probably even had to run to get to Cana by mid-afternoon, desperately needing to make sure he connected with Jesus because he needed a miracle, desperately needed a miracle. And so then, after the miracle occurs, he probably starts heading back home, but doesn't have time to get there before dark. So somewhere along the way, he and whoever is with him probably spent the night, gets up the next morning, and then travels back to Capernaum. And then we read this. It says, while he was still on the way... His servants met with him, this is the next day, met with him with the news that his boy was living. 
And then when he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, Yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. And then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, Your son will live. So he and his whole household believed. And every indication we get here is they believed in the real Jesus. They didn't just believe this time. He didn't believe just in a a miracle-working Jesus, a Jesus that could do things for him, give powerful gifts, do these exciting signs and wonders, but he really believed in the real Jesus. The Jesus who was the long-awaited Messiah, the Jesus who was the Savior of the world, the Jesus who was the Son of God, the Jesus who was Lord of all. That's real authentic belief. And we're told here at the end, this was the second sign Jesus performed after coming from Judea to Galilee. Now, as we read this story and we read the way it's kind of framed, it reminds us of another story. It was the first sign. And interestingly, the first sign that Jesus performed, this was the second, the first sign that Jesus performed happened where? Back in Cana. So there were two miracles, the first sign and the second sign. Both happened in Cana, and they have a lot of similarities. Now, what we believe is happening is what's called an inclusio. And this is a literary device in which a biblical writer places similar material at the beginning and the end of a section of Scripture that signals to you and I, the reader, that the literature is meant to be understood together. It's kind of like there's bookends that bracket the the stories. We start in Cana with the first sign, the first miracle, and we end with Cana and the second sign and another miracle. And so what we need to understand, and this was a literary technique that was common among biblical writers in both the Old and the New Testament, what they're signaling to us is that everything in between needs to be understood as well. It's all one unit. There's a message that's being taught together. It's almost like uh, we'd call a sandwiching. You've got the the first piece of bread, and then you've got the last piece of bread, and then everything in between is necessary to enjoy a full, real sandwich, right? And so what we need to do when we think about this story and understand it, to understand it fully, is we need to see what's in between the two stories, right? The two stories... And this inclusio are events in Jesus' life that both took place in Cana. Each story tells of a powerful miracle. The first one, he changed the water to wine. The second one, he healed a royal official's son who was near death. So two powerful miracles. In both stories, at first, Jesus seems to be a little reluctant to do the miracle. Remember the first one in John chapter 2 in Cana where his mother comes to him and tells him the problem about the fact that the family has run out of wine. And what did he say? My time has not yet come. He tries to resist, right? But he ends up giving in and doing what his mother asked. The same thing here. The man comes begging Jesus to come and heal his son. And what does Jesus do? He kind of rebuffs him. And he says, everybody's just interested in these signs. Will you, will you really believe? And he talks about belief in connection to that. So there's similarities. Uh, and then at the end, John tells us and gives the number to each of these signs. After the miracle of changing the water to wine, he says this was the first sign. After the miracle of healing the royal official's son, he says this is the second sign. Both signs result in true, heartfelt, genuine, authentic belief in Jesus. You remember the story at Cana. After the water was turned to wine, nobody really knew about it except the servants and the disciples. But it tells us that the disciples believed in Jesus. Not just that he was a miracle-working, powerful, kind of a magician-type 
first century prophet. No, they believed that he was really the Messiah, really the Son of God, really the one who could give life abundant internal, the Lord of all. They believed that at that point. And I think that is the type of belief that's also being described of the royal official when he realized that Jesus spoke this word and at exactly the right time, the, the promise that he gave came true and his son was healed and the fever left him instantly at that hour, that moment when the words were spoken. And he was believing in more now than just a miracle working man that could do good things for people that asked him. Do you believe in Do you really believe in the real Jesus? As we look at the rest of the story, the inclusio, we need to look at things like Jesus cleansing the temple. That's what comes right after the the first sign. Cleanses the temple in Jerusalem. And we find there people, even the religious leaders that were corrupt, we find that they too were interested in the signs. In fact, remember in that story, they said to Jesus as they were confronting him about the authority that he used to do this, to run out the money changers and the merchants. Remember that story with the angry whip? He runs them out, cleanses the temple. He had no authority in their minds to do this. So they asked him, can you give us a sign as to to why you have this kind of authority? They wanted the signs. But they certainly did not believe that he was the Messiah the Son of God, the giver of life, the Lord of all. And so Jesus is placing a judgment on them. That's part of what we read in that story. The next encounter is with a Pharisee named Nicodemus, where Jesus explains to him and describes true and authentic belief and what it results in. He talks about have to be born again. It's a, it's a soul change. It's a, it's a heart change where you get a new soul A new life. You're born again spiritually and begins to talk to him about this spiritual rebirth and then gives us John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever would believe, that's true belief, then would not perish but have everlasting life. Then we have a story about John the Baptist where he clarifies that Jesus is the right one to believe in. I must decrease, he must increase is what he said. He's the one that we believe in, the true one to follow. And then we have that surprising story about the Samaritan woman who comes to faith in Jesus as the Messiah and the Savior and the Lord of all, and then even testifies to her village who also come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior, the Lord of all. And then, of course, we find miracle number two that we just talked about in Cana. That's the inclusio. That's the information we need to think about together. And if you look at this information, there's some, inf- some things that we should observe. One of these things is that those who should believe often don't believe. And those who shouldn't believe often choose to believe. That's really what the whole story of the Samaritan woman and the Samaritan village is about. When Jesus is on Jewish soil in Judea and then now back in Galilee, there were a lot of people that did not believe he really was the Messiah and the Son of God and the Lord of all. They believed he could work miracles and they loved that, but they didn't believe in the real Jesus. But he has to go, when he goes to enemy territory, The hated Samaritans by the Jewish culture hated the Samaritans and vice versa. The Samaritans hated the Jews. When Jesus is on enemy soil, what happens? Surprisingly, they believe authentically. And so that's interesting for us to see that sometimes those we expect to believe don't believe and those who shouldn't believe end up believing. I think it would be a horrible tragedy if we as a church have people here that come to church under our children's ministry, in our youth ministry, our young adult ministry, and families in this church of all ages, hear the the gospel but don't really 
respond to the full gospel. I think that would be absolutely tragic, but it can happen. Those who should believe don't always believe. Another thing that I think this story tells us is that it, it is possible to believe in Jesus for what he does rather than for who he is. And we, like them, can get infatuated with signs and wonders and miracles or things that we want Jesus to do for us. And it's real easy in our culture that's a really a me-centered culture to ask, what's in it for me? And it kind of becomes all about me. It's almost like we think of Jesus as our cosmic vending machine. Whatever we need or want, we just go before him and punch the button through a, a, a prayer and expect to get it. And that's really the, the depth of our relationship with him. Remember the story in John 2, 23 through 24, where it says they believed in Jesus, and then Jesus says, but he did not entrust himself to them because he knew the hearts of people. Is that possible that that's us? And if our relationship with Jesus is really just a self-serving relationship, like, Lord, what can you do for me? Like, Lord, I don't want to go to hell, so I'm going to put my faith in you, but that's really my whole motive. Is that really true, real belief? We have to be careful with that. Yes, Part of the gospel is we will have eternal life with him for heaven. Yes, part of the gospel is we will be free from sins and forgiven from our, for our sins because of Christ and what he's done for us. Yes, we get to go to heaven, but it's got to be more than that. It's more about a relationship with Jesus as the Savior and the Son of God and the Lord of all. It's really about releasing ourselves to him. It's not about us anymore. And when we do that, when we surrender ourselves to the Lord and we submit ourselves to the Lord, he tells us later in the scriptures, he says, you got to lose your life. And when you lose your life, what will happen? You'll find your life in him. But it's all about him, not about us. Is it okay to pray for things that we need or want? Yes. Lord, please heal my sick family member. That's what the man, the father, was desperately praying. Lord, I, I'm in a jam. I need your help. Would you help me? Students, will you help me pass this test that I should have studied for? <laughs> but I got to get the grade. We've all been there. Lord, I want this. I want this job. I want this house. I want this car. I want this boyfriend. Fill in the blank. We, we can do that. That's okay. We should do that. We should pray to him and ask for things that we desire and that we need. There's nothing wrong with these prayers as long as this is not the full extent of our relationship with Jesus. And sadly, for some people, like many of them, that was the full extent of their relationship with Jesus. What can you do for me today, Jesus? What can you give me today? What can you help me with today? It's not about us. It's got to be about him. It's got to be about worshiping him and having a relationship with the all-powerful, all-knowing, all-glorious, good Messiah, Savior, Lord of the universe, Jesus if you're following Jesus simply for what you can get out of him, that is a dangerous type of belief. It's a superficial belief, and it is a belief that can send a person to hell. And I think what we're seeing in this story is there is a belief, this is just a, a follow-up to that thought, there is a belief in Jesus that is temporal and temporary and then there is a belief in Jesus that is spiritual and eternal. And I think in this story we see both types. We really see this father progressing in those beliefs. At first, he just believes in Jesus, a miracle worker. He's heard the stories. He's desperate. He needs help. And so he goes and he begs for help. 
And guess what happens? He gets help. He gets the miracle. And his son is saved and healed. But that then, that was a sign, and this is what the signs were for. They were supposed to point people to the deeper belief and the deeper reality in who Jesus really was. Messiah, Christ, Savior, Lord, life giver, life sustainer. And that, I believe, is what we see at the end of the story. That was the decision he was making, along with his entire family and his household, when it says in verse 53 that they believed. Something changed. It was a progress to real, true, authentic belief. You know, as we read this whole story, we've looked at kind of this section, this inclusio, but if we look at the big picture and see how this fits into the big narrative and the big theme and the big purpose of John's gospel, it comes in John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31. John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31 says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of the disciples, miracles. He performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not all recorded in this book. But these are written, the ones that are recorded, these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So the real question today is, do you really believe in the real Jesus? And if you're here today and you have not yet really believed in the real Jesus, today could be, can be, could be, should be your day of salvation. You can make that choice right here, right now, just between you and the Lord through a simple prayer of saying, Lord, I believe in who you are. I believe in your power I know you're a supernatural God with all power. I believe that. I want you to forgive me of my sins. Thank you for the cross that paid for my sins. I want to surrender my life to you, commit my life to you, not just to be my Savior, to save me from hell, but to be my Lord, Lord of all. And when you and I do that sincerely, we receive the gift of life, abundant and eternal. Will you make that decision today? If you do, I want to hear about it. Please let one of our staff people know. We want to come alongside you and encourage you. You can come up to us after the service. You can walk down right now if you want to. I'll be up front. I'll be glad to pray for anyone that needs to make a decision. And the rest of you, too. Maybe you're making another decision. If you want to come forward and let me pray with you or come to the altar and pray, this is your time. You respond as he leads. Let's stand and you respond.